And when I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. And if we're talking tight ends and we're going into round two, maybe round three, give me Ian Thomas, please. Just let's, I mean, let's just do the damn thing. Just based on giving his overall ability. Um, again, I like his arm. I think he can make every throw. The pick at number 12 is in. Happy Friday to everybody. Welcome back to Cover One, the draft podcast. I am Russell Brown. As always, joining me, CP Christian Page on this Friday. My man, how we doing? Doing awesome. Glad it's the weekend. Glad to be talking about football. And man, we are, even though we already kind of were in draft season, we're at peak draft season now because we're talking combine today. Yes, we are. We're going to do offense today because next Thursday, the combine officially begins. More than 300 prospects will be there. We're not going to talk about all 300 prospects. We know that. Um, But we are going to do some offensive stuff today. We're going to talk offensive line, some of the skilled guys. We'll talk briefly about quarterbacks. Um, If, Like you mentioned, if a quarterback is being drafted off of what they do at the combine, the team that's drafting them is probably – failing. So um, it's always fun to, to talk about quarterbacks, but I think we've done a lot of that throughout the, out the year. Um, and then we'll get into some prop apps as well. So that's probably more so where we'll talk some quarterbacks for uh, just some fun 40 time stuff on those guys. But um, since we're talking combine, let's get into the 16 new drills that are coming to the scouting combine um, this year. We won't go into every single one, Um, But for quarterbacks, they've got end zone fade, and then they've got the time smoke slash now route drills. So um, they'll throw one pass to on that one. They'll throw one pass to a receiver running a smoke uh, route, usually a route that is adjusted to at the line based on pre-snap reads, indicating a quick completion that will be available against soft coverage on each side consecutively. So it'll be interesting. So I know obviously I said, oh, you know, you can't really base it off of the combine, but it will be interesting to see what a guy like Justin Herbert does or or Jalen Hurts, what they do in this situation. Then obviously end zone fade. You want to see really the placement there and you want to see – um, how a player can adjust to some of those throws. And if it's, you know, a, a throw that's either off target because it's too far to the left or too far to the right, or it's under thrown, it can make obviously those end zone fades, those jump fade routes a little bit more difficult. Um, do you have any take as far as, or any input as far as quarterbacks go um, on that with those two new drills? Maybe a little bit. I mean, with with especially fade routes, you always have that rapport with a, your main wide receiver. So, you know, some of that may be dictated on based on, you know, even though it may be, you know, one of the receivers turns the wrong shoulder, turns the wrong way. So this may be more from an adjustment perspective for the receiver more so than the quarterback. I mean, the quarterback should ultimately know how to throw a fade route, where exactly to put it, you know, back in of the end zone, you know, make it high enough where only your guy can get it. So it may be more – beneficial to the receiver in this regard to just adjust, get your feet down and so on. Um, I feel like even though, you know, both of these uh, uh, new uh, concepts are, or excuse me, both of these concepts are new to the combine. I feel like they kind of did a variation of them already, Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess it's just kind of extended to be a little more specific um, because you, of course, you've seen more of like nine route vertical passes for the quarterbacks, you know, maybe 40, 50 yard down field uh, in pass combine. So I guess they're just kind of shrinking the field. And of course, in crucial situations as the end zone fame, which is definitely very popular. Uh, it always has been. So it will be good to see kind of in close quarters, you know, how they can really operate. But uh, yeah, nothing really big to take away here. Um, I think, again, like I said, with the fade, I think it's more so maybe more beneficial or not beneficial for the receivers, depending on who you're talking about as far as this drill goes. Yeah, and they're not eliminating anything for the quarterbacks. They're just adding these two drills into the mix. So um, that's – I mean, it, it'll be fun. It'll be cool. But, again, like we said, if, if you're really basing everything off of what happens uh, during combine weekend, then I, I think uh, it's a clear indication that your your team might not be doing the the correct scouting per se. I mean, obviously you're going to change your, your board a little bit 
off of some of the interviews, but generally speaking, it shouldn't be just changing off of, you know, throwing in shirts and shorts, but running backs, a drill that is eliminated for them. There's actually two, the find the ball drill and the pitch and cone drill. Um, They'll be doing the inside routes with change of direction, basically that angle Texas route um, that will be happening here. So we'll see what they do on those routes out of the backfield. And then there's Deuce Staley drill, which is an interesting one. It's named after the former Eagles running back, and he's actually an assistant coach there. Um, the, the drill will involve a running back lining up behind a horizontal step over bag that is part of three bags laid to form a cross. The running back will step over the bag in front of him, then laterally over the perpendicular bag then backward over the horizontal bag before repeating the path in the opposite direction. So I could go on. This is like a pretty big paragraph, but I'm not. Um, obviously, you'll have to kind of see it rather than me describe it, but it it sounds basically like an inside zone type of play, um, some type of zone running. So if Darius Anderson, who I've actually not seen um, on the list, oh, he – he is. He's he's there. That they've got him as Jet Anderson. That's his nickname, by the way, Jet. So that's a drill. That's a drill for him. Um, a guy that I wrote about two weeks ago for us over at Cover One dot net. Uh, this is a drill for him. I think he's going to do very well in this drill. I mean, and I'm sure other running backs will do good as well. I mean, like you know, Jonathan Taylor will probably be fine. Dobbins, so on and so forth. But um, any anything there, or do you want me just to go down these this list? I mean, you can, you know, there's nothing I can really add there because it kind of features a lot of different things, you know, change of direction, maybe some physicality, you know, quick decisions, whatever. I mean, I don't know. There was a lot to take in. That's going to be one of those where I'm going to have to see because I'm picturing that. I have all different kind of ideas. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. The inside uh, routes, though, uh, with, with just talking about, you know, catching the football, I assume. Um, I, I like that idea because, mm-hmm. you know, any variation, any route diversity for running backs is, I want to say crucial uh, in the league, but it definitely is beneficial. And I think angle routes are one of the more successful routes a running back can run. So seeing just kind of some precision and that's when you separate, I'm not saying necessarily, you know, your, your every down backs or more of just your possession backs or your, uh, you know, first and second down backs or receiving backs, but it still sees like, you know, how comfortable these guys are catching the football. I think that's one of the things that you really see as far as receiving drill goes for the running back position who naturally can catch the football. So a guy like, you know, LaMichael P. Ryan, Joshua Kelly, I think this would maybe accentuate some of their skills. Uh, But again, I think there's, with the, with the Staley drill, there's a lot going on. Yeah. To really, like, figure out who that would be good for. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, yeah, and with the, the angle routes, too, I mean, you, you're going to see a guy like J.J. Taylor, who's basically been just under, sure. the, under the radar the entire process. And he has not had the year uh, that he had the year before, but kind of like a Tariq Cohen mold, in a sense, just a smaller body guy, but so elusive and shifty. So that'll be good for him. Uh, for receivers, They're adding the end zone fade route. So obviously, as we talked with quarterbacks, we'll see that. Uh, But they are eliminating the toe tap drill for tight ends. They're also doing the exact same thing as the receivers. So that'll be fun to to see what uh, the bigger body uh, receivers, a.k.a. tight ends, do. Um, Offensive line, there's a couple of different drills here. They're not eliminating any drills, but they did add a um, new mirror, uh, new mirror drill player lines up at set point between middle of two cones, roughly six yards apart and slides laterally left and right based on coach's direction. Uh, the drill places emphasis on feet and the change of direction. So I've always talked about this. I always like to see the way a player can shift his weight, the weight transition between his set foot and his post foot. This was something uh, just two, three years ago when I watched um, film with with uh, Eric Turner on Mike McGlinchey out of Notre Dame when we put it on YouTube for cover one we we talked about so much of that weight transition it was something I noticed immediately for him with McGlinchey it was flawless for a guy that was six seven so it's something that will be very interesting to see you know guys like Makai Becton Josh Jones what do they do here and then obviously the new screen drill is players will set up in pass protection then re- release and then sprint toward the first coach holding a blocking shield 15 yards wide of starting point 
to simulate engage and release action of a screening lineman. So that's also interesting. And I like that drill as well. So um, two of these drills, I think this is a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, I always like watching offensive linemen. It's always fun to see what these guys do. Um, obviously, I know you're going to have some comments here, but also if you're a, if you're a football coach and you're listening to the podcast, one, you need to rate, review, and subscribe. But two, you also need to really watch the combine and see some of these drills because when you get into June and July and you don't have pads on, these might be some drills that you can mimic for your football team. But uh, CP, what do you got for us on offensive line here? Because I'm I'm sure you're interested. Yeah, with these, I, I guess the new mirror drill here is, uh, and I'll go more in depth with, with some players here in a second, but I guess the new mirror drill here, instead of, I would say instead of, partnering with the mirror drill that we're used to, where you're seeing, what is it, the rabbit chasing drill, where mm-hmm. you got the, the other opponent or the offensive lineman running back and forth, and they're making the decision. In this case, it seems like the coaches, which I know there's some kind of variation of that already, but it's more of, I think they're more of like angling down the field and then they turn and sprint. So this one may be a little bit different, um, but any type of mirror drill where you can get your feet moving laterally, I think is a great idea. Like you said, any coaches that are listening, even evaluators, anytime you can see guys' feet move, that's one, That's something that's always going to translate over if you have it because you're going to always have to move your feet, especially laterally when you're dealing with higher end edge rushers, quicker guys, wider pass sets. So I definitely think that the, the, you know, the new mirror uh, uh, drill will be perfect to kind of just get more of a, uh, you know, an idea of how that player can move out in space and pass sets, whatever it may be. New screen. I, I'm there with you. You're seeing a lot more screens in the game today. Uh, more, uh, I guess, variations of the screen. You know, it's not just your typical running back screen, get out in the flat and go. You're seeing more concepts. So I like this. Uh, and the fact of it's kind of like target practice, you know, can you get your, your pad level down? Can you get in the way? It doesn't have to be perfect. I think that's some things that some people may overlook out in space. You don't have to have this perfect strike zone as far as it, but you get in front of the guy, you make a little bit of contact, you just pave enough room, you know, to get that first down or, you know, to keep extending the play. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think both of these definitely accentuate the skill set of the offenses and offensive line in today's NFL. For sure. Um, defensive line. I'm, I'm actually bummed about this one. They eliminated the stack and shed drill, which I understand like, you know, people want to see how fluid guys are that we want to see them as athletes, but stack and shed. I liked because one, it was a little bit of physicality, but two, you got to see how a player looked after he exploded out of his stance. You, you got to see where his base was. Was he too narrow? Was he too wide? Um, how did he handle that and how fast was he reacting during that drill? So now they're eliminating that and they're adding two drills, run and club. Um, five stand-up bags are in a vertical line, five yards apart with the final bag, including arms. The defender will fire out of a three-point stance and run through the bags, clubbing the first with his right arm, spinning on the second, clubbing the third back with his left arm, and then ripping through the fourth bag and flattening downhill to slap bag with arms. So, I mean, I I like this drill. It's definitely more for pass rushers. Um, Obviously, defensive tackles can can use it as well, but this is certainly one of those things that you would love to see like a Chandler Jones go through or a Khalil Mack, and we'll get a chance to see a guy like Caleb Von Chasen go through this drill or um, obviously Chase Young. So it'll be fun to see that. Run the hoop. Two pass rush hoops are laid on the ground, two yards apart, forming a figure eight. Two towels are inside the hoops, one in each, one in each of the hoops. Uh, the, plower, the players line up at the start cone, um, and then in a three-point stance, fire off at a movement of the ball. Uh, they run around the first hoop, pick up the towel with his left hand, cross it to the second hoop, and drop the towel and continue to around the second hoop um, before picking up the towel with the right hand. So uh, basically, this is just your figure eight drill, um, which is cool. But again, I, get rid of the figure eight drill and give me this stack and shed drill, please. I mean, yeah. I, like, I, I don't need to see a figure eight, to be honest. I, but it is what it is. Um, do you have anything to add to that, or should we just keep it moving? Yeah, you can keep it moving just real quick. But the running club, we see a lot of that in uh, Mobile for the Senior Bowl. It seems like mm-hmm. a lot of clubs run that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'll be definitely interesting. And I think it's helpful. You see guys, I think that one's too, it's helpful from a like how quick can they take on direction, even yeah. though I know 
you know, their agents and their trainers will have them prep for this event. But still, you know, if they change, you know, sides of the field or change, you know, a couple of the bags, put them somewhere else that you're not used to, how quickly can you adjust to that? And, you know, are you firing off with the right arm? Are you, you know, firing off with your, your first step, the appropriate first step? So I think from an intelligence standpoint, too, because everybody knows how to run in club. And then, you yeah. know, hopefully, if not, they shouldn't be there. But um, I think that, that I think from an intelligence standpoint, how quickly you can, I guess, absorb coaching. I think something there too. So uh, that, that's just one of the fun things I enjoy watching in Mobile. Should be cool to see at the Combine too. Moving to linebackers, they are adding the shuffle sprint and change of direction drill. That's all in one drill. Um, and then they've got the short zone breaks. They're eliminating the pass drop drill. So with the first one, the shuffle sprint and change of direction, um, in a measure – of a player's quickness and agility, the defender will start in a two-point stance, five to seven yards outside the hash before shuffling across the field. He'll then open his hips, sprint on the coach's command, then change direction on command and finish with a catch of a thrown ball. Uh, short zone breaks, three different route reactions are involved here. A uh, player will drop at a 45-degree angle, flattened out at five yards, and break forward. Um, before catching a ball. So you'll get to see kind of how fluid a player is there um, when they're doing different angles and, and so on and so forth. So uh, that one will be, I think, pretty cool. Pass drop, that, I mean, that's fine. I, I'm cool with this drill. Um, and then with defensive backs, you've got the new line drill. This one will look familiar. Players will backpedal, open their hips at the, at the direction of the coach, return to backpedaling, then open their hips again on command, and then catch the ball being thrown their way. Uh, the Terrell Austin drill, uh, the drill is named after former Lions defensive coordinator and Steelers secondary coach. Um, first, a player will backpedal five yards, then open and break downhill on a 45-degree angle before catching a thrown pass. Then a player will backpedal five yards, open at 90 degrees, and run to the first coach and break down. Then plant, turn around, which is 180 degrees, and then run towards a second coach before catching a ball from a quarterback. Um, and then the box drill is so the dbs are going through a lot of different drills now um the box drill the, the player will back pedal five yards break at a 50 45 degree angle on the coach's signal once he reaches the cone the player will plant open his hips run back five yards with his eyes on the coach there's so much description in here that does not need to be in here um, <laughs> on the coach's signal the player will break towards the coach at a 45 degree angle and catch a, a pass and then the gauntlet drill uh, it's the same drill by the receivers, except it's this time it's, it's defensive backs. So they eliminated close in speed, turn drill, pedal, and hip turn drill. So linebackers, defensive backs, looks like a lot of stuff in space, a lot of stuff with them flipping their hips um, and, and doing different uh, angles, like 45-degree angles and 90-degree angles and how they explode up field. So I like all of these drills. Linebackers, I'm, I'm excited to see a guy we watched in, in Mobile, Josh Uche. Uche? Oh, for Uche? Sure. Uche? 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 Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, you said five names. I don't, I don't know which one you said was right, but Uche. <laughs> Uche. I, dude, I'm telling you, before I did the, the radio station in Detroit, I had to listen to his name like 90 times before the show because I knew I was going to talk about him. But I'm excited to, to see what he does there because, you know, there was times in Mobile where, where he was not good in coverage, I thought. But then there was other times where he was, like, good in coverage. And I'm like, well, this is going to be a fun one for him because he's explosive. He'll probably go through some defensive line drills and then obviously these drills. So um, anything you want to add, maybe some defensive backs or anything or whatever? Yeah, well, just looking at some of these drills here, uh, I feel like – and maybe it's just me being just kind of, I don't know, not paying sole attention to some of these drills in the past, but a lot of these sound very similar. I swear they've run the gauntlet drill before, so I don't know what's really changed there. I mean, maybe it's in the skinny, like you said, with all the description. With the linebacker, though, I like it because instead of, I guess, essentially – just the pass drop they got more specific with the pass drop because it showcases more you know their shuffle their ability to sprint change their direction quickly explode explode out of those breaks and then you know get your eye on the football and then mm -hmm. sprint downfield so very realistic type drills and i think that was probably a point of emphasis just for all of these new drills of just hey you know what's what's a little more realistic i know like you said the figure eight thing i don't get that one because i really don't care if you know 
Derek Brown can sit there and squat down, grab a towel, and run around in circles. Like, that's not going to happen uh, in the real world. <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, it shows some flexibility, maybe some explosion, depending on, you know, how quickly you get up and just keep your pad level. But I think there's other drills that could kind of showcase that more so than just the figure eight drill. But uh, but overall, you know, I like the changes. Um, I say some changes, you know, some just incorporating new drills to kind of get an overarching, you know, feel for certain prospects overall. It will be interesting for sure. Um, the combine, as we, we've said, will start Thursday, February 27th, 4 p.m. this time, not 10 o'clock in the morning like it normally does, which I'm cool with. Um, give me that afternoon so I can uh, get home and watch this thing. Um, but, yeah, Thursday, the 27th, tight ends, quarterbacks, and wideouts. And then Friday, the 28th, is your uh, special teams guys and then offensive line and running backs. And then Saturday is defensive line and linebackers, like we just talked about. And then Sunday, March 1st, defensive backs. So um, we'll get into a defensive combine stuff. We'll talk more about defense next week, probably Thursday or Friday. We'll probably recap a little bit of the offensive guys as well. But let's jump into some offensive uh, players and, and just some of the groups here. Uh, offensive line is where I want to start. I know they don't go until Friday, but I want to talk about them first um, just simply because we love the offensive line and I'm sure we're going to get into a detailed conversation here. Um, but obviously this is going to be an event that is important for guys like Makai Becton because he's a huge human being. And I know we've talked about him the last couple of episodes. If you haven't listened, uh, go back and and obviously rate, review, and sub sub subscribe to the podcast so you can listen to what we were saying. But, you know, 6'7", 370, you've been talking about him uh, really since the start of the season. And now I've been on the train just trying to hype it up because the guy's legit. And I think this is an event for him to really showcase his ability because he has – pretty quick feet, pretty light on his feet too. So um, I'm excited to see what he can do. What's one of the bigger names that you're excited for? Yeah, he's definitely one of them because we talked about, you know, his past sets are kind of strange and we don't know if it was more of just the coaching that he had to digest at Louisville, but sometimes he just didn't, I don't want to say just was stubborn and not move his feet, but he really didn't have to that much because he was 360 pounds. He could kind of absorb it with just that length and just that overall mass. But like you said, we know his feet are pretty swift for the guy of his size, or just an offensive tackle in general. Uh, so I think he, you know, in some of those mirroring drills and some of those drills where you kind of have to, you know, kind of showcase some of those different degree angles where you have to go around the cones and follow the, uh, the, the pass rusher. So I think that would be interesting for him overall. But I think a guy, too, we were talking about weird pass sets. Josh Jones from Houston. You know, we broke down his film together uh, down in Mobile, and it's, it was a weird, weird blocking scheme as far as Dana Holgerson and Houston's uh, offensive line approach. And yeah. it was more like a weird, awkward backpedal. You know, it was yeah. kind of like, I don't even know. I feel like he went off a different foot every time the, the, the uh, snap was uh, initiated because it was almost not like he was catching guys, but it was just like kind of an awkward vertical set, but he didn't really open his hips. He didn't really get wide. It didn't really seem comfortable. It just seemed very awkward, but we saw him in Mobile and he operated kind of in a zone, uh, zone blocking scheme. He looked really good moving forward, opening his hips, accelerating, and playing the outside fairly well. So I think there's his film – I don't want to say I'm going to push it out the way, but I think just some of what he was taught at Houston was just kind of awkward. Uh, not something I say I've never seen before, but for a guy that's getting first-round buzz, I think you know some of that film to be like, okay, let's kind of look past that. Let's operate. Let's, let's evaluate with some of his traits going forward. Uh, so Josh Jones definitely in those mirroring abilities – um, you know, that screen, that new screen drill that we talked about, I think those will be two uh, drills that will really showcase what he's all about. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting too, with, with Josh Jones is, and obviously like you mentioned is, his vertical sets are a little different. It's just like it, the things that he does are a little bit different, but when I was flying back from the senior bowl and I was on my flight to Atlanta the guy sitting next to me, his name was Patrick, and I cannot remember the name of his company, but it's basically like a uh, recruiting and like developing high school athletes, especially for football down in Texas. So he's, he's helped train CD Lamb out of high school. He helped train Josh Jones out of high school. And he was talking to me about Josh Jones because he's based out of Houston. And I wish I could remember the name 
of its company. So I could drop it on here for you guys to smash the follow button on Twitter and, and everything else. But um, he was telling me about Josh Jones and he was like, yeah, you know, he didn't even want to play football. He didn't start playing until he was a, a like late sophomore, early junior year of, of high school. And he actually wanted to play basketball. And he was like, he could have gone and played basketball somewhere, but he, he eventually, I got, like, he, he didn't like say he convinced him, but he basically hinted at like, I convinced him to go play football. And like the, the, some of the recruiters that were recruiting him for football convinced him to go play. And he ended up going to Houston. Um, but like, I, I think maybe that's part of it with Josh Jones is just like, he's not been, you know, he hasn't been playing football as long as other guys like an Andrew Thomas, for example, who has, I think been playing since probably uh, when he was really young. And um, I haven't really done that type of research on Andrew Thomas for that, but um, I just found that really interesting. And it, it, like when you brought that back up, it kind of made me put two and two together for a second. Um, but I, I will, I will talk about Andrew Thomas briefly here. I, I feel like the consensus is starting to turn towards the fact that he's more of a like mid teens to early twenties type of draft pick. And I just find that odd, like out of, I just feel like that kind of came out of nowhere. And I it's mean, it's because Becton gained steam and it's like, naturally you have to force somebody down. Right. That, that's, that's what, what it, people, that, that's what it seems like. And it's just like, I mean, guys, he's still a good football player, like really good. And I think the combine could be an, an, an opportunity for him to put, his athletic ability, which there will be some limits to his athletic ability. Don't get me wrong, but like for him to like, especially like we talked about those footwork drills and everything else where he's able to uh, mirror defenders and everything else. If he can prove that and show like, Hey, I can be a natural knee bender and everything else. Then I think he'll be just fine. And I still think he would be a top 10 pick. And I I don't see that. I mean, we'll, maybe we'll see that in the, in the, in the future on some of these betting odds that, you know, is Andrew Thomas a top 10 pick? Because I feel like he should be. I think there's enough teams in the top 10 that need an offensive tackle. And I mean, this guy, he's so powerful and he's just, you know, I think he does a good job laterally throughout the game. And I just like what he brings as a, as a run blocker. And I I just think he's good. Like he's good folks. Like it's just one of those things, like let's not overthink it and just push him down the board because of one player. Like you can have, multiple offensive tackles in your top 10 and you can have multiple offensive tackles go in the top 10 of a, of a draft or even top 15. And I'm not saying like, Oh, he's fifth, he's going 15th. How, you know, that's terrible. Shame on you. But like, I just feel like the last couple of days I've been like going on Twitter and seeing like people kind of just turn their thoughts on him towards like, he needs a lot of work and this and that. And I'm like, what are we talking about? I don't think he needs a lot of work. And some people are saying he needs to go play guard. And I just think that's asinine. I think sometimes when a player has been at the top of his position or at the top of the rankings for so long, I mean, Andrew Thomas was a top five pick when he put on a Georgia uniform. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we knew that. We know watching, you know, Nick Chubb run, Sony Michelle, and watching them in the national tie, we're like, man, this left tackle, he's a stud. And, like, we knew about him. And so it was almost like now you have you, – you know he's a good player, so it's almost like now you got to be nitpicky figure out why he can't succeed. And I feel like you're just so used to seeing him in the top. It's just natural to put him up there. So it's like when, you know, this other guy, you know, Mackay Beckton, 6'7", 360 pounds, guy moves pretty well. There's a lot of steam. Well, Andrew Thomas, you know, it's kind of bland now because we haven't seen anything new from him. Mm -hmm. Well, he was still an elite prospect when he was like 18, 19 years old. And so you see it all the time, every year. And I'm not going to like say, you know, there's always one guy that, you know, gets pushed down unrightfully or, or shouldn't undeservedly. But it seems like that just – that group think mentality just settles in too often. Uh, and, and, you know, I noticed it, and I knew, like, Leonard Fournette had his flaws coming in LSU. He was mostly, you know, some with, uh, you know, ankle lingering ankle injuries. But it was like everybody wanted to push him down so far because – I mean, at age, you know, we're talking about Andrew Thomas as a freshman in Georgia. Age like 16, we knew Leonard Fournette was going to be a first-round pick. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it it was like, well, let's keep pushing him down, pushing him down. And I know he hasn't had the greatest career at Jacksonville because of some of those injury reasons that come up. But some of the other reasons to push him down the board, I'm like, okay, you're just trying to not like him. Almost like to get venture off so much from the status quo of him being a good player. 
it's okay for somebody to be good for four years or three years. It's fine. There's a reason why people are talking about that. And I'm not saying that's the reason why some people are dropping Andrew Thomas. Maybe there is an, a, you know, a detail that somebody doesn't like. And I respect that. If you can explain it, I respect that. But I think, yeah, I think too. Don't, don't overthink Andrew Thomas. He's still a solid player. He's still a starting left tackle in the league. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'll be honest. I don't know if I'm going to be changing my grades that much um, a- after the combine anyways, but like, he's still my top offensive tackle and I, I have no shame in that. So it is what it is. But one thing I want to say is I've, I've really grown to really like this interior offensive line group in this class as a whole. Um, and I mean, like Jonah Jackson, Ohio state, we saw him at, at the senior bowl. Pretty impressive. I think that he could have a pretty good week at, at the combine as well. Keith Ishmael out of San Diego state. He's got some tools to work with. I think he could have a really nice week. Matt Hennessy uh, from Temple. He had a nice week at the, at, at the senior bowl. Didn't get better every day. I mean, he was pretty consistent, but like he was on and off at times, but overall, like pretty solid Shane Lemieux um, from Oregon. I, I like him a lot. And then obviously, you know, our, our two guys, Lloyd Cushenberry from LSU and Tyler Biotis from Wisconsin. I think the combine could be, you know, a moment where us, Fans could go, hey, he, you know, this Biotis is, is actually still good in space and he's still got good footwork and, hey, he's still okay. So um, that's, I, that's kind of another one of those. You know, he was good for so long and it's like people are just being a little nitpicky. And I know he didn't have like the top 10 year that he was supposed to have, but still it's like he's still a solid interior player. Like don't overthink that consistency. Even, you know, some people may peak earlier but that doesn't mean like when they peak that that doesn't mean like they're still not going to be a good player. Like you can still be a good player when you peak earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I don't know. It's just that that word potential gets overused so much that I think sometimes it almost becomes like um, a black mark. It's like how much more potential does Biotis have? Mm -hmm. Maybe not great, but where he he is now is fine in my opinion. Yeah, I'm with you. And so, I mean, I, I think this is a – it's going to be a fun week. I, my question to you is, you know, we've seen the growth and, and the rise of a player out of Michigan, their center, Cesar Ruiz, um, and then you've got Biotish and, you, and you've got Cushenberry. Out of the three, who wins the week? And could we see – because I, I saw a mock draft today. I think it was uh, Chad Reuter out of NFL.com. He put Ruiz in the first round first interior off, you know, first center off the board. Um, obviously, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on it, but who wins that? Because I think it's – and I, I ask this question about centers over guards because there's a lot of quality guards. We could be here all day talking about Damian Lewis and and some of these other players, you know, like I said, Shane Lemieux and um, uh, Justin Harone and, and so many other guys. But the center position is being – has been getting more value every single year. We're seeing this year in and year out. I mean, just two years ago, we saw Frank Ragnow and Billy Price go back to back. We saw Ryan Kelly from the Colts um, when he got drafted out of Alabama. He was a first round pick. Um, Last year, Garrett Bradbury, he went to the Vikings. He was a first round pick. So there's a pretty good chance one of these centers is going to go in the first round. If not, maybe all three of them, probably unlikely, but like, we're, we should see one of them somewhere in this draft. Maybe it's Miami. Maybe it's Kansas City. Um, you know, I had Biotis going to Kansas City in my mock draft. So out of those three, who do you think wins the week at the Combine? And could we see, and I guess really, who do you see being that first-round potential guy? I think I want to answer Cushenberry for both um, because I think he is just – When I, you know, I kind of vaguely use this sometimes, but when you talk about checking the boxes, he leaves all of them checked. No, no, no blanks are left because he plays with tons of balance, plays with a lot of strength, his anchor solid, his pad level solid. I I think he's going to measure in just fine with his overall length. Uh, He moves well. I think he could probably be scheme versatile just based on, you know, uh, how his athletic profile checks out. So I think Cushenberry is definitely probably, I don't say he's going to be one of the winners, but. Um, I like Ruiz too. I mean, it's hard because I think both guys kind of play with the same impact in the interior because talking about 
Cushenberry checking all the boxes. I think Ruiz does the same thing. You know, 6'4", 320 pounds, you know, he's he's a mauler up front. And he plays with a lot of a lot of balance. He plays with good acceleration, get to the second level. Um, and he has, a, he has a good anchor in pass sets as well. So uh, both guys, it's hard. I don't want to split hairs, but I think Cushenberry, just maybe the impact he had for the LSU offensive line as well, I think his film is a little more consistent overall, but I really like both guys. And I like Biotish too. Um, we talked about him a lot too, but I think just maybe the length and just the overall mass from Cushenberry and Ruiz, they will be, I think, the two top centers off the board. I think Cushenberry overall brings maybe just a little more when you're just comparing the two. It's going to be interesting. I, my vote, again, I, I'm, I'm going to just stick with Biotish. I, I think he'll win the week. But um, we'll see. I mean, I, I can't disagree with you on, on Cushenberry. And Ruiz has been – every football field he's been on, I mean, he was the top center coming out of high school, and he's done enough these last couple of years to push himself up the board to obviously be considered as one of the top centers. So we'll see um, what happens by the time we get to April, but especially next week. And I'm not, And, again, like I said, I don't think the combine necessarily pushes a guy into that first-round category, but I think um, it certainly makes it interesting considering the position – because it's just been growing every single year um, during the NFL draft. So moving on, let's go to some skilled guys. Um, we'll talk running backs and wide receivers as a whole. We'll do them last. We'll do quarterbacks and tight ends next. We'll start with quarterbacks. Just, just give me a guy that you think is, is going to have a, a great week at the Combine. I guess just from a physical standpoint, Jordan Love. I mean, I think the Combine's kind of take his overall ability. Um, that's kind of all I have. I mean, maybe you can see some of the velocity and timing from Jake Fromm. He's a smart guy, so he's going to pick up things really quickly. Uh, and it seems like there's always that one leader in the quarterback group as far as combine goes. I, I could definitely see that being Jake Fromm. Maybe Justin Herbert because he has some of those. You know, if you ask a, a lot of people, Herbert has those leadership qualities as well. I know he's more of the quiet guy, but maybe more lead by example, kind of kind of serving as that second coach on the field. But I think Jordan loves probably – he probably has the most to gain, I would say, out of all these quarterbacks in Indianapolis. I, I can't disagree there. Obviously, I'm, I'm very much on board with, with thinking of Jacob Eason. I, I, I think, you know, he's not the, the best athlete on the field, but, like, I, I'm just curious, how does he, you know, with his size and the arm talent, I mean, he can put some zip on the passes um, or some zip on the ball. So I'm really curious – what he looks like, obviously, just going through these drills, because I thought some of the stuff that he did throughout the year was just more so the fundamentals and the, just the overall technique and just getting the footwork down and not rushing through progressions and everything. So, I mean, obviously, a big job interview on the line. How does he look? Um, I, I like that you said Jordan Love. That would have been the first guy I said. And then another guy for me is just Anthony Gordon, Washington State. Um he was 199 pounds at the senior bowl. I'm, I'm hoping he comes in at like 210. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you, you, you shouldn't draft a quarterback if he's 195 pounds, but let me just say this folks, you shouldn't draft a quarterback. if He's 195 pounds. Like he yeah. looks, he looks like he's 182. Dude. Yeah. He's super skinny, but like I've been talking about him quite a bit. I, I just, I like what he brings to the table. I think he's got some talent and I think he's a nice day three pick somewhere. So if somebody can, can get him, especially if he's like 210, 215 pounds, I think it's interesting with Jake Fromm, I like that you mentioned him. Me, obviously, hello, resident Lions fan here, but I'm like, I don't think Jake Fromm's a first round pick. Maybe he falls in that situation where he does go at the back end somewhere. Like maybe it's the freaking saints or something, or maybe it's the Patriots, but I'm going to be honest. If the lions are really considering a quarterback and which I think they are, but I don't think they're doing it in the first round, but if they end up thinking of it like in the second round or third round and Jake Fromm is there and let's say they make that trade with Miami and they get an additional second round pick or they trade Darius Slay and get a second round pick. If they can get Jake Fromm out of it, hey, I'm cool with it because I think he'd be a fit with Daryl Bevel, and I think he'd be a fit in this offense to learn behind Matt Stafford. Maybe I'm crazy. I don't love Jake Fromm, but I like him enough to where I think my, you know, for my team, I'd be okay with them taking him to 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 be a, a much more functional backup quarterback to uh, my injured quarterback the last two years. So that's my thought there. Um, let's move to tight ends. Um, 
I, I've got a guy right off the go here, and I think I, – I don't know what it is. I'm just falling in love. Maybe it's just the, the saying, let's do the damn thing, you know, hashtag Ian Thomas, Ian Thomas. But Thad Moss for me, man, is 6'3", 250. Guy works his ass off on the football field. And, you know, really only one year um, as a productive receiver in college coming this past year. But he's a terrific blocker. I think he could be a, a, a quarterback's best friend. I really like him as an option in, in Washington. If they roll with Dwayne Haskins, I think he could be that safety valve for him now that they've moved on from Jordan Reed and they don't have a strong tight end group. So Thad Moss's ability as a blocker is, is huge. I think if he can test well and show that, hey, he's got some athleticism and that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree from Randy Moss because that's his dad, I, I think – it would be a good week for him. And I, I think he could be somebody that we talk about a lot more after next week. Oh, hundred percent agree. And you talk about guys just gaining steam as of late. I mean, Thad Moss probably right toward the end of the, the football season, um, the college football season, and just kind of go, getting into draft season. He's gained a lot of buzz. Uh, but I think just somebody that this is the obvious pick of who's going to win the combine out of the, the tight end group. I think it's Hunter Bryant from Washington mm-hmm. guys, just an athletic specimen. And he's going to any type of drill, any type of measurable, he's going to check the box and he has tight end one capabilities, but a guy that too, that entered the pool late Cole commit the Notre Dame tight end. I think I don't want to say the combine's crucial for him, but I think maybe some of those underlying, you know, short area quickness type drills, you know, maybe, looking at the three cone or maybe some of the broad jump, just looking at some of his explosive qualities. Um, I think that that may separate him from being that tight end one for some organizations. It just depends on, you know, how, how much stock they put in some of those drills. So a guy that has tape as far as tight end one capabilities go, I think Cole commit with a really good combine could almost solidify that tight end one spot. But this class may be a little top heavy, but I think there's just a lot of there's a, there's a lot of ath- athletic guys. You're talking about Thad Moss at LSU, but even Stephen Sullivan, the other LSU tight end, he has a lot of athletic ability too. Even though he's playing tight end too, but you know maybe in an offense where he could be that number one or maybe that number two guy as a third down tight end, he could bring something to the table. Um, you know we saw maybe just small flashes at the Senior Bowl in Mobile, but. Jim Nagy's made it for sure that these guys aren't there because their agents pushed them or because of the logo on their helmet. They're there because the NFL has spoken to the senior bowl staff and that they see a future in these guys. So Mm -hmm. that convinced me enough to go back and be like, Hey, Sullivan's a guy that's going to be drafted and he has a place in the NFL. We'll see how he tests, but I think those LSU tight ends, they could steal the show. Sure. There's more (laughs) there. There's two LSU guys there in the tight end group, but, I think Sullivan obviously gets overshadowed by Moss, but he's definitely somebody to keep an eye on maybe in day three to look at maybe just adding something to a a passing role in the NFL. Our Zach Hicks actually talked with Steven Sullivan. Um, Zach Hicks of cover one. Now Um, he he spoke with uh, Sullivan, if I remember correctly, very interesting story. Cannot remember it for the life of me of exactly what he went through, but um, yeah, good stuff. Um, Moving to the running backs. Oh, also, I'm really glad that you talked about Hunter Bryant because, folks, the dude is jacked, absolutely jacked. So when you see him with the, his cutoff shirt at the combine, don't be surprised and, and know that you, you heard that here first because the dude is just absolutely ripped. Um, let's go to running backs, and then we'll do wide receivers. We'll do a couple of odds while we're talking to wide receivers and, and all these skilled guys. Um, you know, obviously, Jonathan Taylor – Many people want to know what uh, the speed is going to be with him. What's the long speed? Because some people don't think he's fast, but if you do your research, you know that he ran the 100-meter yard dash in like 10.61 seconds or something like that in high school, maybe 10.8. Either way, he ran the 100 meters incredibly fast um, for his size. And and Taylor, the over-under is put at 4.51 seconds. Uh, The over is minus 500. The under – plus 300 currently, and this is at oddshark.com. But obviously, what do you think there for Taylor? Do you think he goes over, under that number? I'm thinking under. It seems like the stereotype that he runs in a very heavy pro-style system, a lot of runs concept inside the tackles, that you're not necessarily the speed guy. You're, you're straight-line speed guy. And I know Taylor's not 
maybe a home run threat, but I still think he runs in that 4-4 range. So I'm going to take the under here. Um, Taylor's ability just all, all across the board. It's really hard to find a major flaw. I know he has some fumbling issues, and you talk about how much tread is left on his tires, but overall I think Taylor checks a lot of boxes, and I think speed's one of them. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, I Taylor for me is R, RB1. I don't see that changing. Um, but some people like this guy, DeAndre Swift out of Georgia, his over-under at 4.47 seconds. I feel like that's going to be under. I mean, that's it, he seems so much faster on tape. He does, but gosh, it's hard because I was just tell, telling you before the show, before we hit the record button that, you know, it was mostly talking about receivers, but it's like, you know, if he runs below a four or five, it means he's really slow. And I'm like, well, no, you look at past results and a lot of successful backs in the league aren't maybe as fast as far as straight line speed goes as you think they are. Mm -hmm. Um, I am going to go slightly over, but yeah, you're right. Swift, when he puts his foot in the ground and knows exactly where he's going, he hits a whole nother gear, but I'm going to go maybe slightly over, but still Swift's fast either way. For sure. Um, and the J.K. Dobbins is set at 4.4, 4.49 seconds. Uh, that's the over-under. Man, I want to say under, but it would not surprise me if he went over. I'll be honest. I'm with you there. His game kind of – I don't know. Maybe it's just the patient element that he plays with. Yeah. That, like makes me have a biased mind of like, no, I can't see him running in the four fours. Uh, but yeah, maybe, yeah, I, I'm going to lean towards you. Maybe just like a four, five, two, still an impressive time. Uh, but his game is more style, you know, vision, patience, then put your foot in the ground and get those harder in yards. So maybe just a biased take, but uh, I'll, I'll take the over on that one. Yeah, it's, it's a, and it's a good group of running backs. I mean, the, the, those are the top three on the consensus board, um, and obviously that's why Odd Shark has the odds for those guys. But, you know, don't sleep on Cam Akers out of Florida State. The guy did, um, as Eric Turner always quotes it, and, I mean, he's 100% truthful on this, he turned chicken salad out of chicken shit because that's, <laughs> that offensive line is absolutely terrible. It's um, been so bad for so many years. So bad. And Akers has a lot of talent, and I think a team – that, you know, can get the most out of them would be like, you know, a team like I, I think Houston would be an ideal fit for him. I know their offensive line's not terrible. You know, it's not terrible. It's not great, but I think he'd be a great fit there. Um, you know, Akers would be anybody that can get their hands on him with a decent offensive line, I think can can mold him into something really fun. Um, Zach Moss, just stay healthy, please. And obviously don't run in like four point you know don't run in like the four sixes just just run a decent time and he'll be fine because I, I love me some Zach Moss that's like mini Zeke Elliott right there um, but it's hard to imagine him having a fast 40 time because he has the shortest strides of any player I think I've ever watched um, we talked about John or JJ Taylor um, before the show or during the show actually during those angle routes he'll be fun but I will say this guy and I think this is going to be the guy that might be the fastest running back at the combine and that's Javon Leak out of Maryland listed at six foot 206 um, an explosive player for them every time he touched the football it just seemed like he was able to to take it to the house he, he averaged almost uh, seven and a half yards per carry um, this past year he had eight touchdowns so he's a special teams guy as well he had 804 kickoff return yards on 30 attempts um, scoring twice so it just seems like every time he's got the football in his hands, he's able to make something happen. So I know a lot of people like McFarlane for the um, for, for Maryland, but do not sleep on Javon Leak because it seemed like every single time I watched Maryland film, you know, obviously McFarlane was running very well, but Leak was one of those guys that just like, wait a minute, who is this guy? So um, keep an eye on him. Do you have anybody else you want to add for the running back group? I think maybe kind of putting him in that group that you were talking about, Zach Moss. And we need a gentleman's bet because I don't think Zach Moss is going to run well. And I think it's going to put – I don't know. I feel like it's going to push him late day two, maybe day three. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I just don't see, you know, top-end speed for him. And then there's just a lot of, you know, medical uh, red flags, which you find, you know, an article breaking down some of his, his knee injuries and, and other injuries he's accrued over – in his Utah career on cover one.net, but I don't know. Moss just, I want, like, I like this film a lot. It's a patient runner. He puts his foot in the ground. He's physical. He's a smart runner. Yeah, this is, 
but it's just not an event for him, right? It's not. It's really not. And sometimes, you know, combines are tailored to certain people. I know there's certain drills that you really have to circle. Maybe there's only two or three drills that you circle for each position. I think some of the ones that you circle for Moss may not really showcase what his film looks like. And that's okay. You know, he's not perceived to be this top first round running back anyway, but he's still going to be probably a role player that can work himself into a starting gig. But in that group, I think, you know, maybe spite for that RB5, RB6 type player, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire. Yes, sir. I think both of those guys, if they come away with good uh, combine performances, I think they scratch the surface. Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, I mean, if you look at his film, you got to be really nitpicky to find something wrong with him. I know he doesn't have this crazy uh, burst or this crazy – well, I I should say he does have burst. He doesn't have this crazy, you know, second, third-year guy. He's not going to get the zeros to 60 faster than the defensive back can. He's not going to outrun the second level of the defense. But he's going to run over you. He's going to catch the football. He's going to spin out of contact. He's going to, you know, make, uh, you know, separation as far as whether it's, uh, you know, running routes or, or just, you know, peeling off that tackle. You know, if the tackle is maybe executing a trap block or, or some kind of pull, the guy has really good vision. I mean, Edwards Hilaire, if you're talking just about value itself, you could make him – you know, your pseudo RB1 just based on where he's being projected. Because if he – I mean, he's a starting caliber running back, and you're going to get him, you know, maybe outside the top 50. Sign me up for that all day long mm-hmm. because the complete package, and you really saw that down the stretch in big games for LSU. Michael P. Ryan the same way. Maybe not as gifted in open space, but P. Ryan, you stand in front of him, he's going to run right through you. Uh, he can, you know, has a little bit of athletic ability. He can kind of win in the phone booth, so to speak, um, um, with some quick movements. But he he matches the call for physicality standpoint. He's a really good, um, you know, overall athlete. He has a lot of nuances catching the football too. So those are two SEC backs that I think could gain a lot in Indianapolis because I think they have RB5 skill set, if not higher, written, written all over them. I cannot disagree with you at all on on Clyde Edwards Hilaire, as we would call him C E H. Um, I, dude, I, it wouldn't surprise me honestly if he's one of the first two backs f- off the board. I mean, he, he I, I've been watching him the last couple of days, and I mean, I, I like I watched some of them beforehand, and then like I'm starting to get to more of the film, and I'm just like, dude. I don't find a flaw with this guy. I mean, his ability to just jump cut, his shiftiness to just make defenders miss. I mean, like I posted a clip last night, dude, it was Barry Sanders esque. I mean, I'm not like, I'm not saying the dude's Barry Sanders, but it was like, Oh my, like it, he just so fluid and flawless. And it's like, Mm -hmm. man, I grew up watching a guy like this. I could like, please sign me up, put this guy on my team. And like, yeah, no offense. Send carry on Johnson back to Auburn, please. Give me, give me Clyde Edwards Hilaire because that's the guy that that's the guy I want. Um, And then, like you said, Perrine, you, you, you put it perfectly um, phone booth type of player. I don't think he's got like an elite trait other mm-hmm. than work ethic. Like the guy works his tail off and put him in that phone booth. And I think he's going to win probably nine times out of 10. Um, I, I like him as well. I mean, I, there's so many running backs here that I really like, and we could sit here all day and just talk about that group alone, but let's move to receivers and then we'll get on out of here on a Friday night to go drink beers and uh, do other fun things, but uh, wide receivers, what a group. I mean, <laughs> we saw it this week, Mel Kuyper talking about, you know, 25 to 30 receivers in the first three rounds. And he broke down the math of like, you know, five or six in the first round, seven or eight in the second round. And then like it left us with like 15 wide receivers <laughs> in the third round. So the math didn't add up, but I mean, maybe he misspoke a little bit, but overall, like a lot of fun receivers in this group. And I mean, we could sit and talk about C.D. Lamb, Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy all day long. Obviously, we got to go with the fun topic. Henry Ruggs, what's the 40 time? What's it going to be? Is he going to beat John Ross's record? That's so tough. For, and for uh, those that don't know, the record for John, from John Ross is 4-2-2. And I, yeah. I'm going to be honest, I think he is. Really? Yeah, it's I, just – it's hard, you know, because that's world class speed, and and I mean, but both of those guys showed it when they're in school, and so just because I'm that guy, I'm gonna say no. No, but you I, like four, two, five. I'll go with that. 
I can't. I mean, it's either way, dude. It's still fast as hell. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, no, I mean, it's going to be a great week. I mean, Jerry Judy, C.D. Lamb, Judy for sure. I mean, he's got a show. Um, and I can't remember. Did we say they're getting rid of like that gauntlet drill for wide receivers, right? Like, or no, just the toe. It's just the toe tap drill. So him go. No, yeah. Nobody ever did that drill right, anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. So him doing the the gauntlet drill. I, like, let's see that concentration drops. Like, let's put that to the test here, um, because Judy separation route running maybe near the top of the class, if not at the top of the class. And then obviously C.D. Lamb, he catches everything. Um, and I know I'm talking about the bigger name guys, but like a smaller school guy and a smaller name that we haven't really talked about a ton, Isaiah Hodgins out of Oregon State. This dude just a baller, man. 6'4", 209 is what he's listed at. I mean, he finds the ball. He plucks it out of the air. Fluid athlete. I think he could have a very solid week. And, you know, if it's true, 25 to 30 receivers in the first three rounds, Hodgins should be one of those guys after this week. So with his, with the, 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 you know, the body control, the ball skills, I, I think he's a legit playmaker for, for a team. And with that size, I think teams are going to fall in love with him after the combine. For sure. We were talking about that new fade drill that they've implemented. Hodgins is going to dominate that drill. Dominate. Because he has a lot of just, you know, just uh, what's the right word? I guess technique as a pass catcher, you know, whether like you're talking about body control, um, you know, just discipline overall and keeping the ball away from the defensive back, he's going to do really well. I mean, if we're, if we're picking winners for that drill, he'd be one of my top guys. Uh, Cause I think he has, you know, when the ball's in the air, it's his, he always, he's always going to claim it. Um, He has the long arms to really kind of accentuate that skill. You know, sure. He's not this dynamic um, guy that's going to constantly gain separation over the the middle of the field. Um, but, you know, you get the ball in his hands, he's going to win with physical ability. And I think you just get him down the field, let him go track the football and go get it. He's really fun to watch in that aspect. But it's funny because you were talking about you, you're naming all these big name guys. Well, I feel like they're all big names because all of them are so good and the list just goes on and on and on. So it's not <laughs> like you're, you know, it's like, uh, oh, well, you know, they're just mentioning these guys that everybody knows about. But you know about them because they're all 20 of them are good. Uh, but so some of the guys that maybe can scratch the surface, um, I think kind of, I kind of put them in the same threshold. Jalen Rager that we talked about on the podcast. So I won't really talk about him, but KJ Hamler out of Penn state. I think they're kind of in that same mold where they play some of the, the same type of uh, football, you know, can beat you vertically, can beat you over the middle of the field, get the ball in their hands. Uh, and they can make defenders miss. Maybe Brandon Ayuk from Arizona State's in that same category. I think those are three guys that are kind of on that borderline first round. So Jalen Rager, we're talking about Henry Ruggs and his 40 time. Jalen Rager's still going to run probably a, a sub, you know, four three two somewhere in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be a guy that kind of, you know, maybe gets into that top 25 range. Brandon Ayuk, you know, depending on his health, um, could participate in the week at the Senior Bowl. He's a guy that has a lot of uh, – you know, versatility, a lot of flexibility uh, over the middle of the field. And I think he could kind of be that chess piece for an offense. So those are those are three guys that I think are on that surface that all kind of play a similar role that could kind of just be kind of, you know, battling for a certain position is maybe that, I don't know, seventh wide receiver picked in the first round, whatever the numbers may line up to be. Yeah. There's just so many guys here. And, and you know about them because, you know, they're all good. They're all talked about because – at one time, they were a high-ranked recruit, but now they're sitting at wide receiver 15 and a draft that's littered with so much talent. So, like you said, whatever, the 25 receivers in the first, you know, three, four days of the draft draft is absurd, but it's correct. It should happen. It should happen. And, I mean, and we're not even, like, halfway th- – we're not even close to halfway through the names. I mean, Jeff Thomas out of Miami, a guy that – is probably going to have a good combine. I mean, a guy that's probably been forgotten about at this point, but he's an explosive player. Every time he's on the field, he's making plays. He's got that speed that stretches the field and that short area quickness that teams love. And I mean, he missed the season, uh, the last two season or the last, excuse me, the um, he missed two games on the season because he violated team rules. And I mean, he's just one of those guys that if he can, you know, keep himself clean and keep himself clear, could be a playmaker for a team. Uh, Donovan Peoples-Jones out of, out of Michigan. Guy was fantastic coming out of high school. I watched him playing high school football here at the state of Michigan. And he goes to Michigan, seeing him play there every single weekend. And he's a, a 
you know, a kick return guy, a punt return guy, and he's solid. He's got a great frame, and I think he's he's going to have a good week, but he failed to find that success that we love in college because of poor quarterback play. But again, one of those guys, so the, like you mentioned, so many names for the receiver group. Again, we could be here all day long. And like, I'll, I'll be honest, folks, I didn't even want to do a podcast this long today, but we have so many names like Lynn Bowden out of Kentucky. I think yeah, he was going to be the next guy I brought up. He's one of the most intriguing players in the draft, period, regardless of position. Oh, yeah. I mean, Antoine uh, Randall L for sure, 100%. And I mean, it, you, you don't like to throw the pro compass out there, but that's what he is. I mean, that's that's what he can be. And I, I think, you know, teams like the Green Bay Packers who are looking for that kind of a, a I think of a player that you can utilize out of the slot can can be that playmaker and do different things for your offense. I think Matt Lafleur with with Lynn Bowden would be a lot a lot of fun um, at the next level. And I'm a Lions fan saying that. Tony Brown, Colorado, I you know overshadowed by Chenault at Colorado, but Tony Brown was consistent every single time I watched him um, on tape. And you know he didn't have necessarily the season that you you want to have but I mean 56 receptions five touchdowns and over 700 yards is not terrible by any means so he might not have you know the best combine test scores but for a guy that can be a possession receiver I think he could fit that so there's going to be a ton of names after the combine that we're talking about I can't wait to do it um do you have anybody else you want to add or are you all set my man I think I'm all set I mean, <laughs> everybody. I mean Denzel Mims he was a guy that impressed in Mobile so yeah. he's probably somebody that I guess right now his projection, you could get a little value on him somewhere in day two, maybe late round two, um, I think is probably there. James Prochet from SMU, he showed C flash some ability down in Mobile from uh, uh, and then some of his SMU tape. And Tyler Johnson, one of your favorite players, I think maybe we'll get an actual like uh, hold on where he sits. You know, maybe we'll see his athletic testing because it seems like that may have been the bigger question going forward is like how athletic how how much separation can he get is he just a big body receiver that can get open downfield or can he get open and more the intermediate levels of the field so maybe we'll get some numbers that we can attest for that and get an overall gauge on his game but uh god there's just so many names there's probably some that I'm missing too but I'm glad you mentioned Donovan Peoples Jones out of Michigan because he's a guy that has pretty good tape I know he didn't I think he was banged up quite a bit this year but um, you know, he's a guy that I think could shine in an NFL offense because he has a lot of ability and just wasn't really shown in that very uh, <laughs> bland Michigan offense, I should say, with a very uh, average quarterback. So very bad. Um, Peoples Jones uh, could be a guy that comes out of this class and be like, hey, this is the guy that lasted till day three. But uh, he fell victim to a very solid wide receiver class. Exactly. I mean, did we talk about KJ Hamler out of Penn State? I mean, yeah, just a little bit. That's what I was talking. To, you know, him and Rager have they, yes. they kind of have abilities. Uh, Hamler is a guy that too he can fly. Hamler, Rugs, and uh, Rager will probably be the top three guys in the forty. Um, just speaking of wide receivers and combine performances, Brad Kelly broke down what his predictions were. You know, we always hold uh, you know his conversation of wide receivers very high because uh, you know playing the position and coaching the position. Uh, he has a very good grasp on that. So you can check that out on CoverOne.net as well with a bunch of other content. And we got some stuff coming out here soon. I'm um, working on Noah Igbenogany from Auburn. He has some round one potential. You talk about 40 times, the dude's going to fly. He's a track athlete at Auburn. The guy's going to run probably a, somewhere in the four threes. His tape is a lot better than probably you think, and he gets credit for. I will save my analysis for him later when the article drops and when we talk about defensive players next week. For sure, you will be able to watch him run as well on Sunday, March 1st, the defensive back. So remember, the combine starts Thursday, the 27th of February, um, and it goes all the way through Sunday, March 1st. Uh, be sure to go to you know NFL.com to, to see all the new stuff from the combine drills plus the combine participants, over 300 names. But if you want some deeper analysis on those names, you need to go to coverone.net. And the best way to do that is by downloading the Cover One app for absolutely no charge, no fees, no nothing whatsoever. All you have to do is download the app. So go to your app store, search Cover One, download the app, and then you have all of our content right there on your mobile phone. And you can also access it on your iPad, however you go about your business. So go do that today. Obviously, we need you guys to rate, 
review and subscribe to the podcast. So go to Apple Podcasts, find us there, Cover One NFL Draft Podcast. Go to Spreaker.com. Go about wherever you go and do your podcast. We're on everything, YouTube, everything. Go find it, download it, rate, review, subscribe, and give us your feedback because the more feedback we get, the more five stars we get, the more episodes we get to do every single week. So be sure to do that. And last but not least, smash the follow button on Twitter at Russ NFL Draft at underscore Christian Page, CP. We are done. This is it. We are out. You guys enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the combine next week as it starts Thursday. We'll be back next Friday to talk defensive guys. So until next week, this is Cover One, the Draft Podcast.